So how exactly do Animorph Magus or Animorph Magi or people like Tonks really come about? Is it a genetic thing? If so, how? You'll find out right after this. Hey everybody, I'm Taylor from Beard vs. Geek, where I show you it is okay to be a man and a geek at the same time. Today we're back in the magical realm of Harry Potter, obviously, and we're talking about Animagus and Metamorph Magi, or Metamorph Magus, or, you know, people like, like Nymphadora. Don't call me Nymphadora. Okay, won't, won't go there. So there are three ways that a person can change themselves. One is a person using self-transfiguration, or human transfiguration. And that is where you use a spell to turn yourself into any animal or object. However, if you turn yourself into an object, it is not clear whether or not you can get yourself out of it. But if you turn yourself into another animal, you can get yourself out of being an animal. Now, that realm of magic takes a lot. Therefore, it is only taught in Hogwarts Year 6 and 7 as part of your NEWTs. We know this for a couple of different reasons. The first one is when Harry is in the hallway by a petrified person and all heck breaks loose and everyone comes out of the classroom to see what happened. And one kid was part human, part raccoon. Now the second way that a human can turn from a human into a being is by becoming an animagus. An animagus is where you can only become that one animal for the rest of your life. You're kind of stuck with it. And you don't really choose what animal you become. You just become that animal and it's part of like your personality or something. I don't know, ask, ask JK Rowling. It wasn't really clear on Pottermore. However, doing that to yourself, training you from a human to something else, means that you have to be able to change your DNA. Now, even though human beings share the vast majority of their DNA with a lot of different species, you still need to change some aspects of it and tap into that or transform into that by the use of magic at will but you need to change your DNA. And this is something that scientists have been working on ever since we found out about DNA. For example, there's a wonderful article where they try to grow human parts onto mice. For example, the mouse with a an, an human ear on its back. It's, it's really interesting, go, go look it up. Link in the description box below if I remember. But it is a process and it is hard for us muggles to try to figure out how to do that with science. But in magic, they figured it out. And we know that part of the process is the person has to have a mandrake leaf in their mouth for a solid month. And I can't imagine how that would make your food taste. It would probably, probably be really nasty. We do know that the mandrake leaf is used in a lot of different potions, but I theorize that part of its abilities is to slowly change a person's DNA if they are exposed to it for so long. Now this practice is extremely difficult and that is why the Ministry of Magic has a team looking into Animagus and making sure that they're registered and that they're doing it safely so that they don't like kill themselves or turn half human, half raccoon and can't, can't really get back. That would be a weird, weird hybrid. This brings us to Metamorph Magus or Meta Megamorph Magi or, you know, people, people like Tonks where they are born with the ability to change part of their appearance to fit whatever they want. For example, she can scrunch up her face and she can turn her nose into a pig nose or have a duck's bill or change her hair color or all sorts of different things. But it does take some conscious effort and that does require a certain flexibility with your own DNA. Now, how did this trait become introduced to human beings who cannot do that? I mean, I can try. Nope, didn't, didn't work. I theorize that this DNA got introduced by any magus, the people who changed their DNA to become animals. I theorize that somewhere along in Tonks' genetic history is at least one animagus. Now, this animagus who changed his DNA passed on those genes to his progeny, making it more likely for those people to become metamorph magus, or at least make it easier to become animagus. Now, this could possibly be the reason why in Africa, in the school of Wagadu, I, I, I think I pronounced that right, it's the big, biggest wizarding school in Africa, and part of the things that make them famous is that they teach people how to be an animagus. And 14-year-olds can become great animagus. In fact, they, they scare the crap out of a whole bunch of adults when you had all these African 14-year-olds changing into, like, cheetahs and stuff. And, ah, uh, that must have been really funny. But anyway, it was probably a little bit easier for those kids to become 
Animagus if their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents who also learned at that school how to be Animagus were also doing it. Therefore, instead of being an Animagus when you're an adult, you can be it when you're 14 and not go through the massive pain in the butt and the three years of learning that James and Pettigrew and Black did while they were in school and they really only got it in like their fifth year. I theorize that somewhere down the line, these people who aren't Animagus when they have children and their children have children and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, pass along a gene that could potentially turn them into a metamorph magus. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below and go ahead and subscribe if this is your first time here. If you like this video, you can click right here for an awesome video about the trolley witch or right here for some more manliness and geekiness. Because after all, if the women don't find you manly, they should at least find you geeky. And until next time, beard on, bro.